Martin John Rees is Britain's preeminent cosmologist and astrophysicist. He was named Astronomer Royal in 1995, and in his book, Just Six Numbers, he details how incredibly amazing our very existence is. He says, there are six numbers which allow the universe as we know it to exist and which allow life to thrive, at least here, if nowhere else. Mind you, this is not about planets being a particular distance from a star and having water and an atmosphere to meet the basic conditions for life. This is not about finding life somewhere else. These numbers are about having a universe where stars, galaxies, and planets are even possible. Two of these six numbers that Rees talks about relate to the basic forces that are present in the nucleus of an atom. Two of them relate to the basic texture and size of the universe. And the last two fix the properties of space itself. The first number is n. In the nucleus of an atom, there's an electrical force and the force of gravity. In a helium atom, there are two protons, each with a positive electrical force. Their same charges repel each other, just like a magnet would if both positive sides were tried to be put together. So electricity tries to break up the party. But then there's the gravitational force, which wants to bring things together. Gravity makes objects with mass attractive to other objects with mass. Gravity is much, much weaker than the electrical force. How much weaker? Well, not a thousand times weaker, not a million times weaker, not a billion times weaker, but one undecillion times weaker, a billion, 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 billion times weaker. That's how much weaker gravity is in the nucleus of an atom as related to the electrical force. But if it were just a little bit stronger, take off a few of those zeros, and only a miniature universe could have been created, which would have been cute. Stars and planets wouldn't have been hundreds and thousands of miles across, but dozens of miles. Adorable, for sure. But it would be no universe with life as we know it. Planets would not be able to find a stable orbit around their stars, and stars would only live for thousands of years instead of billions of years. If the force of gravity was a little weaker, the universe would be able to be more complex, and even larger interstellar objects would be able to be found, but it would be a radically different universe than the one that we currently have. Epsilon is the measure of nuclear efficiency, sometimes called the strong force. If you fuse two hydrogen nuclei together, their weight is the weight of the two nuclei minus 0 .007. 0 .007 is the amount of mass that is turned into heat and energy when you fuse these two particles together. It's the explosion which goes with the nuclear detonation. If epsilon were only 0 .006, the only element that would exist in the universe would be hydrogen because there wouldn't be enough energy to convert lower elements into higher elements. No, so no helium, no oxygen, no carbon, no us. It would be a boring universe. If epsilon were 0 0.008, then all of the hydrogen in the universe would have been used up in the first few seconds after the Big Bang. And so no hydrogen or anything else either. This number also, I think, shows that James Bond is elemental to the universe. Omega is the density parameter in the universe at the time of the Big Bang. Now this gets a little complicated. I had to actually read this chapter in the book a few times to get it, but basically it means the ratio of the mean density of the universe to the density just needed to overcome cosmic expansion. I know that sounds like gobbledygook, but stick with me. Think of standing at the bottom of a well and throwing a rock up from the bottom so that it stops at exactly the top of the well. If you don't throw it hard enough, it doesn't make it to the top. If you throw it too hard, it leaves the well. You have to throw it just right. Omega is about how the universe expanded at the time of the Big Bang. Not enough force and the universe would have collapsed back on itself in a big crunch. Too much and the universe would have blown itself out too fast and nothing would have formed. It had to be just right. That's omega. 
Today, that ratio, omega, is 0.3. But the real important thing here is that at one second after the Big Bang, it could only have been one, or what scientists call unity. If it were off of unity by one part in a quadrillion, or one part in a million billion, the universe would have either flung itself out too far, too cold, and too fast, and nothing would have formed, or it would have collapsed upon itself. How little is one part in a million billion? Well, if unity, or one, was the distance between the Earth and the Moon, one million billion of that distance is 0 0.0001 of an inch, far smaller than the thickness of even a piece of paper. So if the density parameter of the universe was off by less than a sheet of paper in regards to the distance between here and the moon, the universe as we know it would not have happened, and we wouldn't be here to know about it. Lambda was theorized by a fellow named Albert Einstein when he ran into a problem when thinking about the universe. We typically think of space containing mostly, well, nothing. We talk about the vacuum of space, but there is no such thing as nothing, even in space. If you isolated a cube of space, there would still be a small number of particles in there, and these particles would exert gravitational pull. People in Einstein's day used to think the universe was static, that it was neither growing or shrinking. But Einstein found that a steady static universe was impossible, for even the tiny particles evenly spread out through the universe would exert their gravitational pull and bring everything collapsing back together on themselves. So Einstein theorized a cosmological constant, a cosmic force of repulsion, which counteracts the forces of gravity. He called this cosmological constant lambda. Einstein thought there might be a lambda, but he didn't have any proof. Its existence was only finally confirmed in the late 1990s. It's a strange and mysterious force which controls gravity. It's such a small number that this force doesn't affect anything smaller than something a billion light years in diameter. It's so small that it's absolutely amazing that it's not zero. Lambda has 120 zeros after the decimal point. It's why it's called the weakest force in nature. But if lambda was even just a little bit stronger, the results would have been catastrophic. Lambda could have, conce could have seized control of gravity early on before galaxies were able to form, and we would not exist. Q is all about texture. And I also think it puts to bed the fundamental importance of James Bond, but I digress. At the very moment of the Big Bang, the universe, still microscopic in size, wasn't completely smooth. It had a texture to it. The amplitude of the texture was one in a hundred thousand. If this ratio was smaller, the universe would not have had the texture to allow clumps of gas to turn into stars and planets, attracted by each other's gravity. If Q were any larger, there would be huge pockets of mass with massive gravity fields with no chance for life. You can still see this texture in the pictures of the cosmic background radiation in the universe. The shifts in color show the shifts in texture. And by texture in the universe, we mean galaxies and quasars and black holes and little planets with oceans and Episcopal churches. The sixth number is one that is so simple and pervasive you might not even think of it as a necessary feature of the universe, but it is. It's the number of dimensions. We can't live on a one-dimensional line. We can't exist on something that resembles a two-dimensional, atomically thin piece of paper. We live in a three-dimensional universe with time thrown in as an extra-dimensional property. If you added another dimension, a fourth dimension, it wouldn't just add to the fun. Gravity and other forces would vary inversely by an order of a cube rather than a square, which sounds, again, like gobbledygook, but what it really means is that any movement by a planet or a butterfly wing would be catastrophic 
and devastating. Three dimensions makes it easy to stand up and drive our car to church. And it also provides stability to the universe. Philosophers, theologians, and scientists use these six numbers to show that the universe is finely tuned. It's as if there's a panel somewhere where there are each six dials, which are dialed into exactly what they needed to be for us and the universe to exist. And if even one of them was off by their mark, by just a teensy tiny amount, the universe and any chance of life would be gone. By the way, when describing this to my kids, my youngest daughter wanted to know where the dials were. She thought they might be in Hollywood. I assured her that there aren't actually any dials, and if they were, they probably wouldn't be in Hollywood. In his recent book, Stars Beneath Us, theologian and astrophysicist Paul Wallace says that the probability of these six numbers being exactly what they needed to be for life to exist in a universe is ridiculously small. He said the probability would resemble taking the time to drill six half-inch holes in a wall and grabbing six darts in your hand, blindfolding yourself, and then heaving the six darts at the wall at the same time. And then finding, when you took off your blindfold, that each of the darts found their way into the corresponding hole. That's how amazing these six numbers are. And it's important to note that the incredible fine-tuning of five of the numbers would be absolutely meaningless if the sixth number, or dart, was off by an even infinitesimal amount. Of course, the question is, how did the universe become just exactly perfect for it to exist and us along with it? Martin Rees says that this shouldn't be too surprising, for if these six numbers didn't dial in correctly, we wouldn't be here to marvel about it. But even Rees says that this isn't a fully satisfactory answer. As humans, we want to know how. We want to know why. And as people of faith, we want to know why it all matters.